Good morning, this is Dr. Mayer, and welcome to Chapter 15. In Chapter 15, we are going to be focusing on long-term debt as well as equity and the capital accounts. We are going to focus on the process of auditing these two areas, and what you'll see is there's going to be some significant difference in the way we audit this as compared to how we audited our short-term liabilities such as accounts payable. When we're looking at the financing cycle, such as long-term debt and and equity. You're going to see fewer transactions as compared to accounts payable. The transactions that you see will involve the issuance and repayment of debt and equity, the payment of interest and dividends, and our primary concern relates to the authorization by appropriate officials in the company or by the board of directors. Let's first talk about our objectives for auditing interest-bearing debt, such as bonds. We need to understand the client, its environment, consider the inherent risk, including fraud risk related to debt. We need to understand internal controls, assess the risk of material misstatement in our substantive testing, including the existence of debt, the occurrence of related transaction, the establishment of the completeness of debt, verifying cutoff, determining that the client has the obligation to pay these debts, and determine the presentation and disclosure of these debts. Some of the components of our assessment of long-term debt can be accomplished in the first year of our audit of the client or the first year when the debt is acquired. One of the things that we'll want to do at this point is to establish a table in terms of interest allocated over the years, when payments are due, if there is a premium or discount associated with debt. Set up the table so that in subsequent years, it's very easy to identify if the organization is meeting the requirements related to this debt. And then through subsequent years, we're primarily focusing on changes related to the debt as opposed to continually testing the elements of the debt that we've established in year one. Questions that we would be interested in to test the internal controls related to interest bearing bonds would be, are the amounts authorized by the appropriate level of management? management? Is there an independent trustee used for all bond issues? Are there controls related to cash disbursements of interest payments? And then finally, does a company official monitor compliance with the debt provisions of the bond? The substantive testing for interest on our interest bearing bonds is very straightforward. At the beginning of the bond, whether it's our first year as the auditor or the first year when the bond is established, we're going to develop a table. The table is going to identify interest expense for each year. We will also pre-calculate the amortization of premium and discount. So at the end of the year, when we're completing our audit, we're simply comparing what management is doing related to interest expense and determine if management is reporting these appropriately. As with other confirmations, that we send to banks, we're going to confirm the existence and accuracy of these bonds. We're confirming the date of origin, due dates, unpaid balances, interest rates, dates on which the interest needs to be paid, and collateral. We're going to be confirming our bonds with the trustee that is holding these bonds. We should vouch the borrowing and repayment transactions, trace cash received from the issuance of the bond, examine the payment and the payment schedule, examine canceled notes for retired notes. We need to trace the disposition of any collateral used to secure these canceled notes. Performing analytical procedures are what we described before. We're going to calculate based upon the terms of the bond Bond, the amortization table related to principal, interest, premium, and discount. And this is going to be the basis for our audit of these transactions. Part of our substantive testing related to bond instruments has to do with evaluating compliance with debt provisions. We need to vouch payments to a sinking fund, the maintenance of stipulated minimum levels of working capital, examine evidence of insurance on pledged property, compare amounts of management compensation and dividends paid to amounts allowed by the agreement. Finally, we need to verify 
the authority for the issuance of debt to the corporate minutes. So part of our audit is going to be reviewing the board minutes of the board of directors meetings. When we evaluate the financial statement and presentation of disclosures, we need to determine that the bonds have been adequately described, the amount of long-term debt paid in the current period, restrictions imposed by long-term debt agreements, and unamortized bond premium and disc. Let's briefly shift our attention to capital stock. With each class of capital stock, we need to identify the number of shares, authorized and issued, par value or stated value, dividend rates, any call or conversion procedures, stock splits, stock options, if any. We will need to examine the incorporation bylaws, minutes, provisions related to capital stock so we can gain an understanding of every class of stock that the organization has in place. The objectives of an audit of owner's equity includes, same thing as we've talked about before, considering inherent risk, fraud risk, understanding internal controls so that we might be able to gain a understanding of the risk of material misstatement. This understanding will help us develop additional procedures, including test of controls and substantive testing. We're looking for the existence of owner's equity, the occurrence of transactions. We're attempting to establish the completeness of the reported owner's equity, verify the cutoff of transactions, establish valuation, and finally determine the presentation and disclosure of the owner's equity within the financial statements. The internal controls that we're looking for over capital stock includes proper authorization, segregation of duties, maintenance of adequate records. We want to see that the board of directors have control over capital stock transactions. If it's a large company, we would expect to see an independent registrar and stock transfer agent controlling the issuance of stock. In small companies, control may be done by segregation of duties related to the authorization, transactions, and custody. There should be a stock certificate book, stockholder ledgers, and then controls over the dividend payments. Substantive testing where we are measuring monetary misstatement includes some of the following tests. We need to obtain an analysis of the capital stock accounts, including treasury, account for the proceeds of stock issues, confirm shares outstanding, reconcile shares outstanding with the general ledger, accounting for stock certificate numbers, examining canceled certificates, and then reconciling these with the general ledger. Finally, we would want to determine that appropriate accounting standards are applied to employee stock compensation plans, determine compliance with restrictions and preferential treatments related to capital stock, such as preferred stock, and we want to determine that disclosures are appropriate. Okay, I thank you very much for your time. I look forward to our next discussion.